You're in the water loop. <laughs> Waterloop is a nonprofit media outlet made possible in part by a grant from Springpoint Partners. For all content, visit waterloop.org. This is episode number 144, Modeling the Mississippi River Delta. It took thousands of years for the Mississippi River to build the coastline of southern Louisiana and its vast network of wetlands and bayous. It only took several generations of people to disrupt the natural land-building flow by controlling the river with concrete and levees. Now, a state-of-the-art, 10,000-square-foot physical model is used to plan restoration projects for the area. As discussed in this episode with Clint Wilson, the director of the Center for River Studies at Louisiana State University. Clint explains how the Mississippi River Delta model operates and the unique learning opportunities it provides to students, scientists, and resource managers. You're in the Waterloop. Welcome to Waterloop. Here with Clint Wilson. He is the director for the Center for River Studies at LSU. Clint, thanks for coming on the podcast. You're welcome, Travis. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Could you explain what has happened to the Louisiana coastline? It, it naturally built up and then humans got involved with the Mississippi River and that changed the coastline. What's that story? Yeah, so roughly 8,000 years ago, eight to 10,000 years ago, you know, what we now think of as kind of the South Central, Southeastern Louisiana coast, those wetlands, you know, weren't there. It was open water. And over about the roughly 8,000 years, the Mississippi River, combination of the Mississippi River and the Gulf of Mexico levels created the conditions where you can start getting the, this delta forming, so the land actively building. And during that time, the river would shift back and forth, and as it did, it would continue to build land, or in some places, just maintain what land it built 500 years before, a couple thousand years before. And that delta cycle, the prograding and degrading aspects of the delta, create a very rich ecosystem, they create, um, a lot of natural resources that are beneficial to local and national, even international, you know, economies. And so, you know, in the 1600s and into the 1700s, um, we started to recognize the importance of the river, importance of the coast. And that process, as it grew over time, um, started to lead to, we need to start managing, managing or quote, controlling the river, okay? And as that happened, they started building levees and they started, you know, kind of trying to fix the river in place. And that continued, you know, that cycle then, you know, led to more development, more industry, more communities along the river. And as that kind of back and forth, right, you, you strengthen the levees and then more communities or more industry. And that cycle basically led to, you know, an ever increasing engineering of the river. Then you get the 1927 flood and a major federal effort then to take over the Mississippi River levees, the, you know, to start to kind of make sure the river stays in place. Well, all of that led to a, basically a disconnect of the wetlands, which for thousands of years had been nourished, maintained, sustained by the river. It led to a disconnect of those wetlands from the river and from the water and its nutrients and sediments. And basically then that led to, over the last 80 years, about 2,000 square miles of land loss and projected in the next 50 years for another 1,800 to 2,000 more square miles of land loss. Yeah. So here at LSU, you have a model of the lower Mississippi River and the Louisiana coast. Could you describe that model? Sure. So the lower Mississippi River physical model covers about 14,000 square miles of southeastern Louisiana about 190 miles of the Mississippi River, all the way from Donaldsonville, Louisiana, to the Gulf of Mexico. And that model is being used to help the state understand how the river flows, but more importantly, how those river flows move the sand down the river. We talk about the sand moving down the river kind of in pulses. And I say sand specifically because many of the important coastal protection and restoration projects are relying upon sand in order to either maintain or build land in coastal Louisiana. And so understanding how the sand moves down 
the river with different flows as we are going to see more and more um, higher levels of sea level, understanding how those move the sand. And then you put on top of that perhaps more natural processes like changes in the flows or increased sea levels or man-made structures such as the river sediment diversions. Understanding how those impact the way the sand moves is going to help the state ultimately better understand how to operate right, um, those sediment diversions or those dredging projects where they want to use river sand. And could you talk a little bit about the time frame that the model reflects? Uh, you know, it, you talked about the size of it, but, but how does that time work? Right. Because of the size of the model and because we use a, a lightweight plastic particles to mimic the sand. So, you know, we've done extensive testing to make sure that these lightweight plastic particles move down our model river the way sand moves down the Mississippi River. And so a combination of the lightweight sediment and the size of the model allows us to reproduce one year in the river and one hour on the model. So roughly about five days in the real world is about 65 seconds in the model. So the way we run a year in the model is we set up five day chunks through an entire year. We scale the river flows. We scale how much sand would move during those five days. We scale that down to the model scale. We then basically put that into some control software and the control software when we hit go, it tells the water pump, pump this amount of model, you know, water into the model for 65 seconds, inject this amount of model sediment for this, again, the, the 65 seconds. And then after that, we move to the next five days, or in other words, the next 65 seconds, right? And so we're basically going through a year in the model, high flows, low flows. We're going through that in roughly an hour. So you work in this incredible part of the world that has really unprecedented uh, change. You have the Mississippi River, and then you have this incredible science, this world-class leading model. What's it like being part of all of that? It's just energizing every day. It's from you know knowing that we're helping, you know, study and helping the planning and ultimately the operation of these coastal restoration, important coastal restoration projects is is exciting. I think the opportunity to work with bright young minds, students who want to come here to work on some of the toughest problems in the country, let alone the world, is, is very energizing. And so, um, and then also getting to interact with a lot of different people. You know, we can, you know, one day we might have an oyster fisherman from St. Bernard Parish. Then that afternoon it could be a, a congresswoman from North Louisiana. Then the next day it could be a river scientist from the UK. You know, so you get to interact with a lot of different people, um, scientists, politicians, lay people, middle schoolers, et cetera. And so that also kind of gives you that almost refresh, you know, to just talk about what you're doing, to, to get engaging questions. You know, often, you know, it's almost every time visitors come, you get a question you've never had before. And so that's really cool and, and, it, and it's invigorating. And I think it translates then to really helping prepare our students because they get that opportunity also, right, to think about what is it we're doing? Why are we doing it? Who are we working with? You know, they get to work with people doing numerical modeling. They get to interact with people who are on the river, making measurements in the river. And so they get that opportunity to talk about the science, the engineering, about the dynamics of the river. And then they also then get a chance to translate that, to talk to middle schoolers. You know, some of them were middle schoolers you know, five, six years before that, and now they're helping educate the next group coming up. Mm. And I think that's a valuable experience for our students. But just to follow on that, why is that type of education of all these different stakeholders and then having a place people can come get educated, see the model and the other displays you have, why is that part of a solution for the Louisiana coast? Yeah, I think what we try to do here is help people understand how the Louisiana, at least the, 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 the south central, the southeastern part of our coast formed. How the river, the, the river that drains 42% of the continental United States came down and formed you know, the south central and southeastern part of our coast. And then how that created such a rich habitat. How it allowed communities to then be developed and for people to live there. The cultural aspect of Louisiana is so tied to the coast. 
the economics, you know, the, the Coastal Protection Restoration Authority will talk about it's a working coast, whether it's fisheries, whether it's ports, whether it's oil and gas, it's a working coast. And so helping people understand that it's the river and the dynamics of the river that help form the habitat, the ability for the communities, the economy, et cetera, then helps them see why the strategies, the projects, right, that CPRA is designing and building um, will work. And also then tr talking about, you know, the science that's been done that has led us to understand these processes and then turn those into action. Waterloo. Thank you for listening to the podcast. To find all episodes, sign up for email updates, and connect on social media, visit waterloop.org. Waterloop, Waterloop, Waterloop.